our um, next speaker is ready for us and we're really excited to hear from her, Dr. Sarah Hanif Mirza, who's talking about adult neuromuscular and non-invasive um, in the pulmonary area. She um, is an assistant professor of the Department of Medicine at the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Rush University Medical Center. Um, before we get started and we, we see you getting ready, so thank you so much. Um, we just wanted to let you know that on the app, you can also do session evaluation. So you guys just can just take a minute after every session and just um, give us your feedback. That would be really helpful. Sarah, if you'd like to share your slides and begin your presentation. Okay, so I'll give a few minutes for um, the feedback Part and then we could get started. Oh, you can feel free to begin at this point. All right. We can okay. hear. We can. Can you hear me well? We can, Doctor. Thank you. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for um, having me participate in this very, very interesting and very fascinating um, collaboration and, and cooperation between the three different. Uh, uh, disease processes that we're discussing today. Um, one part that I want to say is that I work not specifically with any one specific kind of neuromuscular respiratory weakness. I am an adult pulmonologist and I work with a wide range of patients with um, any form of neuromuscular respiratory weakness. So we're going to talk about um, the concept of neuromuscular disorders and how it can impact our patients as they progress from childhood to adulthood, and what are the situations that I deal with, and um, what are the implications and how we go ahead and go forward. I do want to give my disclosures. I do not have any disclosures that are pertinent. Um, so let's just jump straight in. So when we talk about in terms of genomic um, manifestations from a from a pulmonary perspective, um, there's, there's a clear pattern that we see when, it, when we look at patients who are coming forward, but you know, be it from a pediatric age, one of the big things that just jumped out in terms of what I'm seeing is, is the presence of hypotonia in um, some of the children. And that is a marker of an understanding of what exactly is happening from at a muscle and a nerve level. And, and for that, I'm just gonna go into a little bit of physiology and the graphics may not be specific to um, you know, one kind of specific disease process, but I just want us to understand what's happening to the respiratory cage and the respiratory system and how that impacts um, the manifestations of disease as I see with, with patients. So if we look at, so this is a pressure volume curve that I've given you of a, of a healthy group of patients in contrast to patients who in this situation are patients with muscular dystrophy. Um, a delta of pressure is able to generate a large amount of volume that is generated. Now, in scenarios where regardless of the etiology of muscle weakness, um, the, hype, the loss of that muscle strength impacts the amount of tidal volume that the patient is able to generate, the total lung capacity drops. And how that will manifest for a patient when we see them and this may be something that is progressive over time. And it's also not something that is the same in every patient, as, as we know very well that the penetration of each disease is different. Each child will be different. Some will have less or more of a manifestation of uh, any form of muscle weakness. And, and if it goes on to impact the respiratory muscles. So that loss in that tidal volume, uh, the tidal capacity will impact the tidal volume and then that tidal volume, the patient will compensate by increasing their respiratory rate. So hence increasing the workload, increasing the fatigability, increasing the uh, or decreasing the functional capacity 
for um, our children and adults as they mature when we're dealing with a muscle weakness. So the, the interlinking of the respiratory system with, the, uh, with any kind of neuromuscular weakness is, is very profound. Now, what's also very prominent is that for a normal patient, we're looking at 45 to 70 ml per kilogram for their average tidal volume. Now, as that weakness progresses, it's not necessarily their breathing that gets impacted right up front. What we are seeing with some of our, our um, like uh, for our patients is that it may be more of the respiratory clearance or their ability to cough or their ability to open up their lungs fully that gets impacted much earlier than they actually develop any form of respiratory failure. So vast majority of the kids or the adults that you guys are seeing are not in this category. Now, of course, I'm seeing a different spectrum of, of neuromuscular weakness patients. So I may be coming across patients who are developing the whole cohort of respiratory weakness. So based on that, today I'm going to be talking and focusing more on the impact on the cough and the airway clearance and the ability to take a big enough breath to be able to generate that airway clearance and how that impacts um, our patients um, in, in particular um, that we're interested in today. So here's a graphic that actually talks about how and what we do when we generate a cough. And, and I would encourage everybody in the audience to just go ahead and go ahead and cough so that you go through the mechanism of exactly what it is when you go through a cough. So everybody, you know, I hope everybody's masked and, and um, is not going to cough on each other. But if you just do it once, you'll understand what I'm talking about. So the first part of that coughing was that swooping in that negative phase when you start filling up your chest and then there's this point of acute change in pressures within your respiratory and abdominal cavity. And that is combined with your glottis opening up. And then you have this forward propulsive flow that is created. And that coincides with the sound part of a cough. And that's the delivery of flow of air that's coming from within your thoracic cavity. And with that, you're able to expel or expectorate any amounts of uh, phlegm or secretions that may be present down below. Now, the parts and the components of this cough are extremely important. And any amount of hypotonia, glottic hypotonia, can impair or affect the ability for our kids to be able to handle that airway clearance mechanism. And that leads to increased risks of respiratory infections. That leads to an increased risk of aspiration events. And that's the point that I want to discuss today is, is how can we go about minimizing or mitigating any form of weakness that becomes apparent in this mechanism. And, and this all stems from the reduced capacity to fill in the lungs and hence the reduced capacity to be able to expel enough of an air to be able to generate that forward flow. So muscle weakness, trunk muscles or bulbar muscles. We're going to go along this algorithm and respiratory muscle weakness is all linked in to the hyperventilation as well as um, sleep uh, disorder breathing. And that can lead to ultimately some resting hypercapnia. If there's inefficient cough and sleep disorder breathing, that's going to go ahead and, and promote more atelectasis, lead to more pneumonias, lead to airway obstruction, and hence will lead to your patient becoming more and more um, increase in their work of breathing and affect their ability and their quality of life. And, and as it was so beautifully portrayed in the last presentation on how the impact of one spills over into the impact during the day, how a sleep quality and character can impact the developmental uh, neuronal connections and, and behavior disorders are linked in to the quality of, of uh, sleep. So here, we're talking about the increased risk of aspiration leading to more fibrosis, leading to worsening lung compliance over time and changes that are becoming more and more fixed by the time they make it over from the pediatric side to the adult side to see me. And then of course, if there are any kind of uh, spine changes or any um, truncal ribcage changes, 
those can be impacting the respiratory muscle compliance and the chest wall compliance, and that will play into our work of breathing within the respiratory system. So the issues with the cough and the aspiration, what can we do about it? So this is a way that we assess the ability to see how strong of a cough can be generated in our clinic. Now, I've purposefully taken a picture from a really, really long time ago, as you can witness by the, the make and model of, of the computer in front of you. But this is, I just wanted to say that this isn't rocket science. This is a simple concept. It's essentially a basic peak flow meter attached to a mask, and the patient is asked to create a good, strong cough to be able to generate a forward flow, and that gives us an objective measurement because that's the hardest for my, for my parents of little kids to be able to tell, you know, it sounds like they're coughing fine. It seems like they're bringing up phlegm and up. How do I create an objective number to be able to trend over time to see if there is a change that I need to intervene and jump into um, to be able to prevent uh, future disease or developmental of pneumonia? So getting that value is extremely important. And if we have values greater than 360 liters per minute, that's considered normal. Any value that is less than 270, that puts my patient population at risk. That's the point when I would trigger and initiate any form of airway clearance uh, mechanism. And we'll talk about what are the different modalities and different forms of airway clearance that I can offer my patients. And certainly, if you drop below 160 liters per minute, that is considered ineffective for being able to adequately expectorate and, and clear your, your secretions. Now, the purpose of starting at a level higher than when we count as, as ineffective is that I need a little bit of buffer you know, from the point that I see them in clinic to the point that they're coming back to see me again and getting retested. So if they decline in that interim, I'm able to catch them from, you know, I want to be proactive and prevent disease rather than wait for disease to develop. Um, and plus, if they catch any kind of a concomitant respiratory illness, any kind of weak uh, respiratory infection is a stress on the system and will cause a transient decline in their muscle strength and capacity. And that can quickly overload their ability to be able to generate uh, 270 liters per minute. So the minute they start hitting that 300, 270, that's when I'll jump in and start working on airway clearance. Now, broadly, when I talk about airway clearance technology, I divide it up into a vibration-based technology or a cough augmentation-based technology. So when we talk about vibration-based technologies, I'm talking about airway vibration that can be done at the lips or it can be done at the chest wall. So when we're talking about at the lips, we're talking about a simple a cappella device that's portable, the patient can hold it. The patient has to provide the effort to generate that forward flow. So the patient, you need cooperation from the patient to be able to do it. So, you know, we need our, our kids to be able to, you know, um, follow instructions adequately to be able to generate a strong enough flow. And there must be a good lip seal. Uh, there are some newer electromechanical acoustic uh, airway clearance devices that are now being approved for home usage that are effort independent. So, you know, a care provider can just hold those over the patient's mouth or as a mask or as a mouthpiece and, the, and turn on the machine and the machine's able to create the same kind of airway vibrations at the lips to help transmit that kinetic energy down into the lungs and help mobilize those secretions that they can make their way out. So every vibration at the lips is one option. And then the chest wall vibrations. This is again, patient effort independent. And again, we don't need any form of bulbar strength to be able to participate in opening up the airways. Um, and this will just help generate enough vibrations that secretions can make their way out. And, and this is a, a study that literally, um, you know, everything makes a lot of sense when you put it down to, to, to dollars and, and, and money. Um, so pre and post utilization of high frequency chest wall oscillation on you know, utilization of money, both from an, a total amount allowed from an inpatient usage in terms of their pulmonary diagnosis. So a significant drop in their rates of pneumonia, um, 
after they were initiated on a chest wall um, oscillatory uh, device. So again, this is not a applicable for all, but for patients who are at risk, who you identify that they have a weak enough cough and their hypotonia is involving their respiratory muscles, that is an area that we need to intervene upon and, and make some changes. Now, paying a lot of attention to secretion consistency is huge because to be able to bring up secretions, we need to be very, very cognizant that the secretions can't be too wet or over uh, or over dry. And if they are dry, the things that we can do is, you know, get some medications that are artificially making their secretions extra dry. Um, anticholinergics are notorious for that. Are they mouth breathers? Um, and if that's the situation, you know, provide ambient humidification to minimize those risks. Provide nebulization with just simple, you know, it can be salt water. Saline nebulization can help um, thin out the secretions. It's the best mucolytic and humidifier for any kind of uh, supplemental support. Um, and if the, if the secretions are too wet or there's, you know, too much silurea or, or that's interfering with the ability to um, swallow, those can be reduced by um, going the other direction and minimizing the amount of saliva production. Now, another concept that's also very important is lung volume recruitment. So part of that ability for that airway clearance, if you go back to the time when I had asked you to cough, the first part of the cough was <gasps> taking that breath in. So that taking that breath in, we need that primary capacity for you to be able to pull it in. Now, if you do not have that initial capacity, then a simple apparatus like this that I provide to my patients in the clinic with a one-way valve, an ambu bag, and a mouthpiece, and we're just asking you know, for, for someone to bag along with the patient making a respiratory effort. So we're able to open up their lungs to a higher capacity, and then the patient can cough. So timing that pump of the ambu bag along with the patient's effort will then give yield a more effective, and this is simple and, and portable and does not need any fancy devices. So patients who are coming close and they you know, aren't there yet for any kind of uh, airway clearance machines, then uh, this is a simple methodology that can be tacked on and added on to the treatment regimen. Now, same concept, but if I, if that patient, if my patient is already on any form of non-invasive ventilation, or if they're on uh, sleep disordered breathing and they have a device at home, now those devices, uh, now a lot of them have the option of multi modes to be programmed in. So a device that's used for sleep apnea at nighttime can have a secondary program to help with air insufflation. So using that with a little sick ventilator can help with what we call as a breath stacking. So the patient gets a big breath or they take one breath in and they take a second breath in and then they cough it out. Uh, and you can use that to assist your cough. And it's easy. The patient doesn't need a secondary person to help, um, help them get that extra breath in. You don't need someone else to ambu bag you in. Patient has the sip close by and they can reach out and, and use that um, as, as needed. So that's, that's a, an interesting, uh, that's a good way of going about things. Now that was from what we were talking about from a um, vibration-based technologies. Now, when we're talking about cough augmentation technique, there's something to be said about just a simple double stacked cough. Teach them to just go ahead and do a spontaneous breath hold. Of course, you need your patients to be cooperative to be able to learn this technique. It's essentially one inhalation, hold your breath, a second inhalation, and then you cough it out. And then we already talked about the ambu bag or using the SIP ventilator to double stack it. And then the, uh, the age old assisting that cough with a manual abdominal thrust timed with that expulsion phase that you can create enough of a forward flow to help clear out those secretions. And then finally, you can have the concept of a mechanical inex suffilator. And, and I, you know, explain to my patients, the concept is exactly the same as an age old rubber plunger that you use for your toilet. You know, our lungs are essentially a whole series of, of plumbing tubes. And um, you've got something stuck in your plumbing tubes that you can't cough up. Think about what do we do with that rubber plunger? We push it in, it moves the air and water into that pipe. And then when we suck it right back out, 
all of whatever was in that airway comes out with that negative suction. So the concept of that mechanical inex suppurator is that it will start, it will push it in, hold it for a second or two, and then suck it right back out, creating that negative um, uh, force that allows you to expectorate effectively. So can be utilized by yourself if you're strong enough and can be uh, assisted by somebody else and using a face mask if there's bulbar dysfunction. Now, bulbar dysfunction is a little tough when using a mechanical inex suppurator because that can at times interfere with the ability to tolerate those rapid changes in pressure. So it works great with patients who have neuromuscular weakness without bulbar involvement. With bulbar involvement, it, it can take a little tweaking. You may have to slow down the pressures to be able to generate um, enough of a flow that the patient can tolerate at that cross-section in time. Now, this is, uh, you know, just a simple, you know, a diagrammatic representation of how your expired volume literally doubles before and after using the, uh, the mechanical inex suffolator. And that is directly related to the amount of pressure that is applied. So pre and post, and we're looking at using pressures of 15 versus 30 versus 40, and you can see that there is a dramatic improvement uh, with the inex, uh, inex suffolator in terms of the inspiratory flow and the expiratory flow in both situations. And hence, you're able to have a more effective um, airway clearance. And in this study, they also monitored the entitled CO2, and that went down after usage of the inex suffolator. And that's, that's a clear testimony to the fact that the inex suffolator is not just clearing out the secretions, hence allowing air to move more easily. It's also helping recruit lung units. And now you've got more of your lung open. Think of it as a balloon that just got an opportunity to fill up with air and um, you're able to ventilate more effectively. And, and that effect of that benefit of that airway clearance spills over into nighttime usage for any kind of, um, for, for sleep. And this, this study, I find that it was just a very simple design, but it's a very clear explanation of concept in which 20 patients here where they were with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And these were patients who were comfortable with using their cough assist. They, they had randomized them first to nights where they use their cough assist device. They use standard settings for all of the kids. And then they had them sleep for five nights with the cough assist applied and then five nights without the cough assist applied. And the difference was so stark. So their quality of sleep at night, so the tidal volume improved after using the cough assist, their respiratory rate at nighttime as they slept, that went down, um, their minute ventilation was lower and overall what we call is a rapid shallow breathing index, which is basically an index of how comfortably you're breathing. Are you huffing and puffing? Are you panting with small little volumes or are you taking bigger breaths and breathing at a more comfortable uh, rate? And it seems to be statistically significantly lower in um, the group that did use the cough assist versus the group that didn't use the cough assist um, prior to sleeping. And that, you know, just it's just such a, a neat way of explaining and, and proving and buying in from our patients when we show them this kind of data to help um, understand and explain the benefit of using a cough assist. And then along with constantly evaluating the ability to protect the airway, swallow, ventilatory needs, the constant assessment from an aspiration or a swallowing perspective is very, very important. So when we are running our muscular, uh, our uh, multidisciplinary clinics, we're working closely with our speech and swallow pathologists who are continuously evaluating each one of our patients um, when they're transitioning over to the adult side. And it's a similar setup on the pediatric side. So not just to maintain the nutritional needs, but to prevent complications from an aspiration perspective. Um, and that's something that, you know, if I look through the literature, it's again and again, it's either respiratory failure or respiratory infections and the risk of aspiration leading directly into that risk for respiratory infections is super high. And a clinical swallow test, if there is signs of desaturation, 
or moving over to a video fluoroscopy if there's signs or concerns for um, um, aspiration. And then that also kind of links in very closely from a respiratory muscle strength perspective is that if we do recognize that any of our uh, patients are developing any form of uh, chronic aspiration, that it's unsafe for them to continue taking diet PO would be the timing of that uh, feeding tube. So we follow their breathing test numbers and we kind of triage out based on their forced vital capacity when um, and which form of a feeding tube is, is safe for them to proceed. Can they handle conscious sedation? Can they undergo a procedure or not? And 50 and 30 to 50 is the zone where we would go with an IR guided procedure instead. Now sleep disorder breathing, I'm not going to elaborate further, but there are multiple different algorithms that are out there in terms of identifying those patients who are at risk. And certainly if there is concern about hypotonia, these patients should be screened and aggressively uh, monitored for any signs of uh, sleep disorder breathing and referred over for a sleep evaluation. Um, and and you know, I, I would be reiterating our previous presentation when we come to that. Now, tracheostomy is probably going to be a small, very, very small subset in, in the audience um, for today's uh, conference. But there are certain situations if from an airway clearance perspective, or if a patient is admitted from an acute lung injury perspective um, from an infection, that they are at a point where it's not looking like it's going to be safe to extubate those patients. So this comes up again and again. Or if the patient is unable to tolerate sleep apnea therapies. And we have made a lot of advances in terms of utilizing different kind of interfaces. I know a lot of our kids may not like the full masks that go over the nose and the mouth. They, they get uh, scared. They don't like the claustrophobia. There are lots of you know, less scary looking uh, interfaces, the ones that plug in the nose, the ones that go under the nose and over the mouth. So they're, they're, they're definitely much better tolerated. And we made a lot of progress in the comfort and the fit of these masks in the last decade. But there will be that you know, patient who is unable to tolerate no matter how hard you try. And then in that situation, a tracheostomy may be the answer. It's really an important decision and it should never be a rush decision. So the preemptive conversations ahead of time uh, before there is any kind of bulbar involvement, get the, the patient's ability to um, weigh in if they would want that. And at a time when the patient's symptoms are stable, so it's not a decision made in um, yeah, an emotionally charged decision. And you know there are lots of things to talk about from when we talk about um, the aspects of tracheostomy in terms of whether we want to be utilizing that as a form of prolonging life versus quality of life. And you know there are options of patients utilizing non-invasive ventilation during the day or the sip and puff ventilation, if you remember, we had used that as an augmentation for our coughing, um, can also be utilized as a way to help support respiratory muscle weakness um, if the choice is not to proceed towards a tracheostomy. And then of course, narcotics to help uh, balance off that uh, desire or that uh, sensation to breathe. Uh, invasive mechanical ventilation is certainly an option, a choice, and, and needs a lot of discussion regarding the support system, the drain from a care provider perspective, and it is certainly the procedure of choice in, in some patients. So for the right patient at the right time with the right support system, it certainly is the right way to go moving forward and recognition and preemptive discussions and trending um, the patient's respiratory muscle strength over time helps us plan and, and not be doing it in a situation where we're going in as a rescue, but to plan and, and preemptively do it. And the things to discuss and the things to you know, be uh, cognizant of is not only is it a matter of connecting over to a ventilator, the ability to communicate is, is going to be impaired. Um, there are ways around it to some degree if the respiratory support need is not that high. Um, home ventilators can have passive circuits that allow uh, an adequate leak. Then some newer ones with very sensitive leak compensators, they can go up to 125 liters per minute of a leak and they will allow patients to phonate. Um, 
But that being said, it is difficult and needs a lot of respiratory effort to be able to do that. Uh, so, you know, those are real hard decisions that need to be made ahead of time. And that would kind of wrap up uh, what I was going to talk to you guys about today. And I'll be happy to take any questions. I'll see if there are any questions in the chat box. Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. Mirza. We have one question. If an adult has a weak chronic cough with no other symptoms, is that a sign of a problem? It certainly would be a sign of problem that would that can be easily remedied and, and rectified because if they have a weak cough and, and we can get objective data to say, yes, it is weak, then go ahead and you know get respiratory muscle strength testing, prove that it is a muscle weakness issue, and certainly start chest clearance, airway clearance techniques to keep you from uh, that problem becoming a bigger issue. So preemptive um, prevention is, is key. So depending on that patient, if they have an ability to um, participate themselves versus need external help in participating, we would choose the right airway clearance device to help them um, deal with that weak cough. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate it. Um, and for those of you, if you had any other questions, just let us know and we can get them back to Dr. Mirza at another time.